Good morning, good morning everyone. Everyone is um, awake and, and, and chirpy this morning. We're going to look at three main things uh, here today. The idea of what amounts to copyright. So we're going to look at um, the copyright regime in Barbados um, and the copyright principles enshrined in the Barbados Copyright Act um, basically mirrors the, the principles of copyright law found in legislations throughout the Caribbean. So it's, it's typical of with minor modifications here and there, but essentially it contains generally what we understand to be um, copyright law um, in most in most countries, the intellectual property policy enshrines basically the the norms that are found in the copyright legislation, and also the policy and procedures on research ethics. And the intellectual property policy enshrines those principles. So, and because they are found in policy documents of the university, a breach of those rules. Uh, could amount to misconduct, which can, which can uh, uh, result in action being taken under, under Ordinance 8, as the policy on and procedures on research ethics makes it explicitly clear. So in that context, one has to be very careful, because a lot of these actions, uh, if you infringe them, or these policies, if you infringe them, can result in disciplinary action. So it is a, it's a very serious matter. Uh, not simply in terms of um, your, your employment here, but generally, uh, breach of copyright is a criminal offence, and I think people tend to forget that they can uh, be imprisoned um, for breaching um, intellectual property. So we're going to start with looking at a brief introduction of intellectual property, sorry, copyright law in Barbados. Um, But before we do, we just want to give you a, 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 just a, a general breakdown of what other types of intellectual property protection that exist. Um, intellectual property generally protects creations of the mind. Um, so creations of the mind expressed in words protected by um, copyright. Creations of the mind protected, expressed as inventions, technical solutions to problems, protected as patents industrial designs, trademarks, protecting marketing assets. So when you think about it, um, intellectual property basically protects creative assets, marketing assets in the case of trademark, technology assets in the case of patents, and creative assets in the case of copyright. Um, and we have other intellectual property rights, for example, industrial designs, the designs of cars, uh, uh, perfect examples of this. Passing off is the common law action. In a case where you don't have your intellectual property registered or your trademark registered, you can have an action for breach of uh, the law of passing off. If you divulge information to a person in confidence, the common law action for breach of confidence protects that. So if you have a business plan, uh, or, or, or an idea for a, a business or idea for a novel idea to do something and you go to a financier to get funding for that they say no to you but later on you see a business set up with your idea the common law can protect you the breach of action an action for confidence breach of confidence will protect you insofar as you've uh, diverge that information in circumstances which imparted a, a duty and obligation of confidence, that person must respect that confidence. Okay? But it's always, of course, you have the common law action can protect you, but it's always good to go with a, a confidentiality agreement, have them sign it first. Although persons are a bit wary, you, you, come in for them, you come into them for money, yet you have an agreement. But it's the standard practice to have persons in, in, in those fields sign that. And you have geographical indications. It's making a, 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 a some serious resurgence, but it's becoming increasingly important in the context of the Caribbean. Um, we don't have that many geographical indications. One example I can, I can think of, um, actually, let me just throw this out. Any one of you can think of a, a geographical indication in the context of the Caribbean? You have a clue? Okay, well, very good. <laughs> give me an example. I didn't get a chance to give you the, the hint. I was going to say Jamaica, but yes, Blue Mountain Coffee is um, uh, efforts are being made to see if that can be protected as a geographical indication. 
Um, so let's go into, into copyright. What, what exactly is copyright? And as with other intellectual property rights, they are statutory rights. Without statutory protection, they do not exist. So it's a statutory right which subsists in literary works, dramatic works, musical works, and artistic works. So these are the primary um, works that are protected under it's like, of course, we um, are concerned, uh, well, actually, we could, the university is concerned with almost all of these rights, um, literary works, books, articles, pamphlets, your lecture notes, dramatic works, the Center for Creative Imagination, um, musical works, and artistic works. These are the works that are protected. Other protected works include sound recordings, um, films, broadcast, cable programs, and typographical arrangement of a published edition. For example, how many of you bought the newspaper this morning? Yes. If you just open a newspaper, you just see a page. That layout of the page is protected as a typographical arrangement. So in addition to the, the newspaper, the, uh, the, news, the company having copyright in the words, as a literary work, you have protection in the actual page, the layout of the work. So you have two types of protection, in a sense, in the case of newspapers. You have protection as a literary work for each article, and you have typographical arrangement of a published edition. So you have double protection there. Yes. What does what does it take for copyright to subsist in the work? We've identified the types of works that are protected. So, fine, we've identified your lecture notes in class or the report that you presented to your, your supervisor or the person in charge of, uh, res responsible for your work. How do you know that copyright subsists? Copyright subs comes into existence automatically. So there's no requirement for registration. Whereas in the case of patents, you must apply to get a patent, you must apply to get a trademark. There is no such requirement for, for copyright. Copyright subsists automatically when the work is created. Okay, so you've written a report, copyright subsists in that report as, as soon as it's created. You write a play, you create some music, copyright exists as soon as the work is created. There's no requirement for registration in respect of copyright. So in addition to it coming to existence automatically, there first must be a protected work. The work must fall within the categories of works that are, that are protected. So it must fall within any of those. Oh, sorry. It must fall within any of those for it to be protected. Secondly, it must be original. And original in that sense doesn't mean that the work must be new in the sense that it must not have been done before. That's not what originality means in that sense. Originality means that you must not have copied it from somewhere else. I'm sure you've seen countless movies um, of tit uh, about the Titanic, the sinking of the Titanic. No one has a monopoly on the idea of representing in a film form the sinking of the Titanic. But the idea, that, that, is not, that is not original. Or Tarzan, you have remakes of so many of these movies nowadays, Spider-Man, etc. So copyright doesn't require that the thing not have existed before. All it requires is that you must, not, you must not have copied it from somewhere else, which in, which in effect tells us that you can have cop that a person can have copyright in the same thing. Because if I did not copy it from you, it means that I can have copyright in whatever I've created, irrespective of whether or not it resembles or it's similar to yours. The point is, I must not have copied it from another source. It must be in tangible or in fixed form. The music must be recorded. The literary work must be recorded in the form of an article, in the form of a, for example, I'm giving this talk now. 
Is it is it in is it is it in a tangible or fixed form right now? Yes, it will be. It, it is recorded. Yes. What if some of you, some of you writing notes? Who owns the copyrighted notes that you're writing? You do? Why? Why do you own the copyright in what I'm saying? Tell me. You might not be quoting me for word for word. So what are you doing? Okay, if you're not quoting me from word for word, what are you doing? What are you doing? You paraphrasing, you are uh, expressing it in, in your own words. And we'll see later on that copyright would, would exist where a person is expending sufficient effort, skill, and labor in creating the work. But if you simply write everything I say verbatim, I would own copyright. And I'll make sure that um, when we leave here, check to see if all of you are writing what I'm doing. Oh, I'm just kidding. But in terms of tangible form, there are two exceptions in, in that a cable, a broadcast, it protects the emission of the broadcast. So it's not in tangible form. So if this was being broadcast live, it would be a broadcast. But it's not, it, uh, it's, it's, but it's not in tangible form because it's really the emissions of the broadcast that, are, that copyright would, would, would protect. So in that, in that sense, it would not be um, in, in a fixed form in that regard. Originality, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's no need for inventiveness. First point, it must originate from the author. And as, as you were saying, you must expend sufficient effort, skill, and labor in creating the work. You must have expended your own skill. You must have used your own words, used your own creativity in creating that work. Copying, of course, will not confer originality. But that's not to say that you cannot use works from other persons. The whole notion, nothing in a sense, except if your Einstein is really new, we all build on on works of others. And in a sense, that's what copyright is, is there to do, is to provide this incentive for persons to create, while at the same time allowing them to use. And when we look at later, you see copyright law is riddled with so many exceptions. Exceptions for research, exceptions for journalists, exceptions for libraries, exceptions for students. It's probably, there's so many exceptions you wonder why you have the right at all. But the point is, is that allowing others to use the copyright works furthers creativity. It allows others to create new works. And that is one of the incentives of allowing um, such protection. So copying, therefore, would not confer originality. Short works, for example, are not usually protected. Words are not usually protected. And why do you think words are not protected as copyright? Why do you think that? Why do you think words are not generally protected as copyright? What would it do if I have, oh yeah, that's, that's giving you the answer. What, <laughs> if I give you the example, the answer becomes quite obvious. Um, what, why, why would you not want to allow somebody to have a monopoly on words? Think about it. Yeah, why? Because words are the right. So, in other words, words are the, the building blocks of language. And if you allow persons to have a monopoly on words, it means that no one will be able to communicate as you, as, as you said. So, you could use a trademark. yes, you can get a trademark, nonetheless. But the trademark, the trademark is limited in that the trademark, you get the trademark in respect of using the word in the course of trade in respect of specific goods and services. So if I get a trademark for the word treat, let's, let's put aside the, the notion that it's descriptive. Let's put that aside. But if I get a, a trademark for the word treat for my guava jam, that will certainly prevent other persons from using the word treat in, to sell similar goods or 
the same go of a jam. But he said he would not prevent you or anyone else from using the word as an ordinary part of language. So that's a difference. Copyright law would prevent anyone from using that same expression. And how else can you use treat except for saying treat? So it'll prevent you from using it at all. So, and this is an example, the Exxon word was, was inventive. Exxon expended a lot of money, apparently, in creating this word. So although it was inventive, they could not get copyright over it. Of course, they now they have um, trademark protection. Okay. Um, we we mentioned that before. It must be recording in writing or otherwise. Um, its presentation is being recorded. What you've written is now in tang is in tangible form. It's now recording in writing. Um, it applies in the case of literary, dramatic, or musical works. Um, So sound recordings, films are inherently intangible. So you can, you can, you can, one second. One, you can have a film on a, 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 a tangible, so it's only, that should be broadcast. Broadcast and cable programs. You were saying? What about computer programs? Where do they fall? Well, Well, I'm not sure what the Barbados legislation says, but most some legislations uh, allow copyright protection for computer programs. I mean, there is a, a fine line between providing protection for copyright and and patent protection. But most most cases, you, you do have it, it makes an express provision. Some legislation makes express provision that copyright does exist or can be protected um, under a copyright regime. But um, but even even the general law of copyright should apply to protect um, computer programs. Duration of uh, copyright. Literary, dramatic, musical, and artistic works is the life of the author and 70 calendar years following the death. So the life of the author plus 70 years after the person died. That's the length of protection. Of course, it seems very long, um, but when you think of it, in the general scheme of things, it's, it's probably not that, not that long. Um, so so uh, companies, are, are persons in the music industry, for example, are, are you know, ensuring, and, and, and I suppose in the publishing industry as well, are looking closely at when copyright expires in those various, in those various um, um, works. And of course, remember, copyright is based on legislation. So in some countries you have seven, life plus 70, in some countries you have life plus 50 in respect of the primary works. So uh, if a work is getting off copyright, then you want to ensure that um, you, can, you can be able to use it almost as soon, soon thereafter. Sound recordings, films, cable programs, or broadcasts, 50 years immediately following the calendar year in which it was made. So you have 50 years for these derivative works and 70 years for the for the primary the primary works and in this contrast with um with uh, patent law patent protection where you have a monopoly for only 20 years and trademark law you have a monopoly granted for 10 years but renewable in perpetuity so you can have a, a trademark forever if you wish but you certainly can't have a, a copyright forever. It lasts 70 years after the death of the author. Patent law, you can only have it for 20 years only. Authorship, and, and, and that's quite an important issue. Who actually is an author? And being an author um, is important in so many respects. Authorship grants you ownership. Ownership is the economic right in a sense. So you can alienate ownership, but you can't alienate authorship. If I write a book and I assign it to a publisher, I've assigned ownership, but I will forever be the author. Okay? So the person who creates the work is the author. The person whose, whose skill, effort, and labor brings the work into existence. So those of you writing your notes, you will be the author. You've expended the skill, effort, and labor in writing whatever it is that you're writing. 
and therefore you will be the 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 author, the creator of the work. So the report that you write, your lecture notes, etc., are works that that you've created. You've expended the, the skill, effort, and creativity in, in in making it, and therefore um, you would be the author. For example, the person who writes a book, usually the author. You may have co-authors as well. We'll come to that later. In respect of dictation, the speaker will be the author and not the writer. So if you're writing exactly what I'm saying, then I will still be the author of, uh, of whatever you've written, yes. Um, in the case of ghostwriting, where the person has an idea and they give it to somebody to write, and it's the person who writes it that really um, does the um, bringing it to life, but the person gave you the idea of what they wanted, who who takes whatever um, right there? I'm not sure that necessarily covered under the law, under copyright law per se, but I suppose that would be subject to an agreement that you would have between the two parties because copyright law would not protect the idea. And that's a very basic principle in copyright law. It protects the expression of the idea, not the idea itself. So if you give someone an idea to write a book for you, let's just say to write a book on uh, the slave, the whatever, what is it? I think I'm an example. The, the 1938 yeah. riots in Barbados, mm -hmm. for example. The person would would then write the book, but they would expend their own effort, skill, and labor in writing it. So the expression would be theirs. So in strict copyright terms, they would own the copyright. However, but of course, this is always subject to whatever the parties have agreed. So, although the law would, would say that the person who, who created the work would be the author, if there's an agreement to the contrary, if you have agreed with somebody else that I would give you this idea and you would create the work for me, then um, any agreement to the contrary would, would supersede that. It's very similar to sort of commission works. The person um, who commissioned the work um, the person who uh, actually wrote the commission work would be the author, subject of course, subject of course to an agreement to the contrary. So contract law always, in most cases, can supersede the, the, what the law requires. Okay. Any other questions? In a literary and dramatic work, um, the author would be the person who created. Same thing here. In artistic work, it would be the artist. The, you know, pho photograph, the photographer. In sound recordings and films, the person by whom the arrangement is necessary for making such are undertaken. So it'll be the, the producer who would be the author in that regard. And the broadcast, the person actually making the broadcast. As I mentioned earlier, the person who creates the work is the author. That is the person who is who's expended sufficient effort, skill, and labor in creating the work. The author is the first owner. Ownership's, ownership of copyright gives you the, basically, the economic right to create, sorry, the economic right to exploit the work. So it's the owner that can prevent persons from copying the work, translating the work, making copies available to the public. Usually, the author, as it says here, is the first owner, so the author would normally exercise those rights. But it's not always the case that it's the owner who would have to exercise those rights. If you've assigned ownership to a third party, then it is that third party who would have the economic rights to exploit and to prevent third parties from using, your, your, using the copyright work. Okay? And another contentious issue is the question of um, works created by employees. And of course, this is the uh, position in the law of Barbados. You will see later on when we look at the university intellectual property policy, the extent to which the university IP <laughs> policy uh, mirrors uh, what the law in Barbados provides. If the work is created in the course of the employment, <coughs> the employer is the first owner. So if in the course of your employment, 
you create your work. So, for example, you are now that's a bit tricky because um, you have uh, your lecture notes. It's always a big contention. Who owns lecture notes? You are an academic working at the university, um, or you have a report. Who owns the copyright in that report? Um, if it's created in the course of your employment, then the employer is the first owner, especially in circumstances where, um, especially circumstances where you are employed to do exactly the, what you've created. So if you're employed to create reports for submission to somebody else, you, you are employed to create um, those works, then, then um, you will, sorry, then the employer, sorry, would be the, the, first, the first owner. In respect of commission works, the person who commissioned the work is the first owner. Now that is that changes depending on the legislation you're looking at. Some legislation actually provides that the the, the authorship remains with the, uh, the 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 person who actually created the work, but that is always subject to the specific legislation that you're looking at. Where two or more persons come together and create a work, there would be joint authorship. That joint authorship would result in joint ownership. And if there is joint ownership, neither owner could exploit the work without reference to the other. So if you've written an article, a draft article with a colleague, that person cannot submit it for publication without your consent because the publishing agree well, I suppose they can submit it, but nothing else can happen because the publisher would normally require both authors to sign the, the release, the license to actually publish the, the article. So it's certainly important. We'll be, coming, we'll be looking at the, the issue of joint authorship in the context of uh, uh, integrity in terms of the UE, UE's policy in a while. But it's important to note that if two, person, two or more persons create the work, they will be joint authors, and as such, they'll be joint owners, and neither party, neither the parties, for example, cannot exploit the work without reference to, to the other um, joint owners. Expending sufficient effort, skill, and labor makes you an author. The author is the first owner of the work, and with ownership comes various rights. So, in a sense, copyright legislation, in fact, copyright is a negative right. It doesn't say that the copyright owner must copy the work. It doesn't say that the copyright owner must translate it. It doesn't say that the copyright owner must perform it. What it does is to give the copyright owner the right to prevent third parties to do any of those acts which are expressly reserved for them. So, and that's a very important point, is that it doesn't dictate what the copyright owner must do. What is what is doing is to, to provide the copyright owner with the right to prevent third parties. So for example, only the copyright owner has the right to copy the work. It doesn't say that you must copy, but it certainly provides that a third party cannot copy without the authorization of the copyright owner. And that right to copy is the reproduction right. So you cannot, of course, subject to whatever exceptions which will be coming to later, um, the right to copy best in the owner of the copyright. Issuing copies to the public. So when you go to, when you walk on Swan Street, is it Swan Street? Yes, and you see those fake DVDs. First, they've copied, so they've infringed one. They've issued it to the public, two. So the distribution right, the right to distribute work, works to the public, is a right which only the copyright owner has. And if you want to do so, you must get authorization. The right to lend the work to the public, 
I think there was a company, it might still be in existence. Chub is it Chubby's? I think, I don't know if they still do it now, but back in the day, the, all, all their, I think they probably, all their works were, uh, um, or they were infringing because they had no authorization to lend, to rent those works. And I suspect they, they, they don't either right now. Well, that's subject to, I, I, in fact, I don't know, so I really shouldn't be, be liable. <laughs> but I suspect, that, I suspect they have no permission. <laughs> to perform, show, or play the work in public, the public performance right. So all these are restricted activities, restricted things which only the copyright owner can do. Third parties cannot do so without the authorization of the copyright owner to broadcast the work to the public or to include it in a cable program, the broadcasting or cable right, to make an adaptation. So someone reads your novel and thinks, wow, that's, you make that into a good movie. The right to adapt the work from a literary work to a, a dramatic work on stage or a film vests in the copyright owner. And of course, that's a very valuable right. You see the number of movies that are being made from, from those books and the authors become instant millionaires while the rest of us starve. <laughs> what does it mean, therefore, to infringe? A person infringes where they take, where they've taken the whole or a substantial part of the copyright work. So, Either they've taken the whole of the work in its entirety or a substantial part of it. Now, the question of whether they've taken a substantial part is not a quantitative test. It's not a simple say, oh, they've taken 75% of the work. Or they've taken 80 or 90. Well, it invariably, it, it would invariably be the case if you've taken 95% of someone's work, you've basically taken a substantial part of the work. But it's not always the case that, uh, I suppose, the, 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 the higher the percentage, the more likely it is that you've taken a substantial part. But it's not quantitative, it's qualitative. So you may very well have taken a small portion of the, 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 the claimant's work, for example, the copyright owner's work. But that may very well be the essence of the person's work. So the question always for the court is what is the relationship between what has been taken and the original work? And then you ask whether or not that which has been taken represents the essence of the claimant's work. If it is, then you'd have taken a substantial part and therefore you would have copied. The courts look at the question of, is there a connection between the original work and the infringing copy? Did, did the, the defendant, the, the alleged infringer, did he or she have access to the work? Did you send that person a draft copy? Did that person have access to your computer? Was, is your work freely available? Is it in the library? that person could easily have had access. So the first question is, did that person have access to your work? Secondly, you look at, you compare. You, edit, you isolate the differences, you isolate the similarities. But were you more concerned with what? The similarities or differences? The similarities, you're more concerned with the similarities. But then, in respect of the similarities, so the first thing you do, Similarities, differences. I need, do I have it on this slide? Oh, I don't have it, but we'll, we'll, I'll explain it. First thing to do in terms of infringement, that's what the court would, that's how the court would assess it. Isolate the similarities and differences. In respect of the similarities, ask first whether they're so common. So if they're so common, it, it clearly means that anybody could have come up with it. Secondly, whether in those things which are similar, they express general ideas. Because remember, as I said before, copyright law only protects the expression of an idea rather than the idea itself. So when you have isolated the similarities, you ask yourself two things. Whether or not those things which are similar represent general ideas, in which case you remove them from the batch. 
then you ask yourself whether or not those things which are similar represent things which are so common, expressions which are common, you remove them from the, the batch. Then you're left with the rest of the similarity. Then you ask yourself whether those similarities represent the essence of the copyright holder's work. If so, there would in fact be infringement and it would be there would be a substantial taking or taking of a substantial part of the copyright holder's work. In making that consideration, you have to look at the distinctiveness of what is taken, and I suppose that is part of determining uh, whether or not um, whether or not what is taken is common, because if it's common, it's certainly not very distinctive. Secondly, whether or not what, what was taken represents general ideas, which we mentioned before. If it is general, then it, it, does, it, it doesn't form part of the equation because um, copyright law does not protect it at all. And it, a good example is uh, Dan's Brown book, The Da Vinci Code. It had, as you, as, I'm, I'm sure I may be read the book, but the theme that Jesus Christ didn't die and had got married and had children, etc., etc. That was the theme which ran through his book. The same theme was found in the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail. Copyright law does not protect that idea, which is what the claimants allege in that case, alleging that, David, that, that um, Dan Brown um, infringed copyright in his book by virtue of him using those same themes. The court noted that copyright law does not protect expressions of ideas. It only protects, sorry, does not protect ideas. <laughs> At least you're paying attention, very good. <laughs> does, not protect, um, does not protect the ideas themselves. The idea of Jesus Christ um, uh, having children, getting married, etc. But the way in which he expressed it, and he expressed it in an original way, he expressed it in his own way, therefore, he had copyright protection, there was no infringement. And I think this contrast, I'm, I don't have it here, but it contrasts with a, a recent case with, um, what's the name, J.K. Rowling. It hasn't gone, it hasn't gone yet to court, but it was, it, was, um, it, it went to, it, it reached the high court level on a, an interlocutory stage, meaning that um, she argued an, uh, an infringement action was brought and she basically counterclaimed to say that the, the cause of action uh, was bound to fail. So the person brought the action, she doesn't want to go to trial, she makes a summary, well, she applied for summary judgment, basically telling the court, this action for copyright infringement is bound to fail, you need to throw it out right away. So she made an application for the court to throw out the person's case because in her, in her view, there was no case. So the court had to determine first whether or not it should strike out that claim and give summary judgment in her favor. But whereas in the, in the, da, in the Da Vinci Code case, Dan Brown was able to provide his first drafts, his research, everything that went into creating this book, guess what? J.K. Rowling does not want to provide any of her first drafts, any of the information that she used, any of her notes which she, or the note paper she wrote when she said she was writing it in a, a cafe in wherever she was, Edinburgh at the time. And the court, of course, the court has not made a determination on infringement yet, but the court, having viewed the evidence, says that, said that it raises the presumption that there was in fact copying and that it will now go to trial. So there will be a trial concerning whether or not J.K. Rowling had, that's not to say that she's infringed, that has not yet been determined, but it's obviously striking that the court did not find that the claim had no merit. So we will, we will see, that's something to watch. So there are, there's also secondary infringement. So if you possess an infringing copy, you are also infringing. If you import an infringing copy, so when you travel, make sure that you don't bring in infringing copies of works. Otherwise, you'll be sent to 
Or was it, was it jail? How was it called? Dodds? Yes, Dodds. It was something else before. What is it before? I can't remember. Glendary, right yes. Yeah, I've, I've paid for the original copies of these books, but do I have the right to go and uh, sell them, uh, you know, uh, a resale uh, right then? Does that right belong to the to the well, author or the, or the producer of the work? Well, you have the right to sell your own book. I can't imagine, yeah, your own copy, but I can't imagine it. A third, a third entity has a right um, without express, oh, I mean, you have it taking place all the time. That doesn't necessarily mean it, it's correct. You have all these second-hand bookshops, but it really should should get permission from. Especially if you're not the person, if you're not the person who actually bought it, then you should really seek permission from the copyright owner. Because what you're doing, you're, you're issuing the work to the public. So that's what you're doing. You actually, but if you if you have it's your property. There's nothing there's nothing in the law that says that you can't dispose of your own property. Okay, but. I, I, I think that UE Bookstore buys all text. Yeah, but I, I would imagine that UE Bookstore has the right to talk okay. to yourself, of course. I can't imagine they would they would be doing that without. <laughs> yes, there are somebody here there from the bookshop. Yes, I I I would be I'd, I'd be rather surprised if the bookshop uh, of all places. Was in, uh, I just. Such. My question is, I just would like a little more clarification on the uh, question posed by the gentleman. Uh, Amazon, for instance, has a number of, um, you, one, can, one can register as a second-hand uh, bookseller uh, and sell used books which can be purchased through Amazon. Um, are they in breach of, of some kind of law? And what, go on, and what is, what is it that is preventing someone from buying books and reselling if this is now their property that they're now use selling as as used books. I just need clarification in terms of you saying that's inf that is an infringement. But if Amazon is doing it and there are a number of other secondhand book dealers, which I think in 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 some instances the library buys rare material um, from rare books, which are used old secondhand books from dealers, is that an infringement? Yeah, I think as I said before, the the right is to distribute the work to the public. So you must get authorization to do that. So if you accept that as a very basic premise, then a third party selling books, the same book, whether it originates from the publisher or elsewhere, shouldn't matter. You are issuing copies to the public. It doesn't matter that the, cop the copy you have is an old edition. It doesn't matter the copy that you have is uh, from somebody else. You are doing an act which only the copyright owner can do. So that's one. And respect of the the Amazon, Amazon, the, the, there's I suppose there's, argu there's an, an arguable point that they are um, facilitating infringement. If those persons with the websites do not themselves have permission, but um, they're not, in, in my view, they're not uh, uh, they're not infringing directly. So they may they, they could be an argument that. Uh, they're infringing, but then again, do we know that those persons do not have permission to do what they're doing legitimately? That's the first thing. Are they under an obligation to make sure that those persons have proper licensing licenses before they actually use their, their service? Are we not putting too high uh, an obligation on such a uh, site to monitor every single person to ensure that every single thing they sell, they get clearance beforehand? But I suppose to answer your question directly, if you accept that very basic premise that only a copyright owner can either authorize or sell or issue books to the public, then it necessarily means, of course, we see it happening all the time. But the fact of the fact that it's, it's taking place on such a wide scale doesn't necessarily just or mean that it's acceptable or it's, it's in fact lawful. I I, I kind of worry about. If I'm, I'm, say I'm living in, um, in some remote place and I went into New York to buy um, a book and five friends of mine who have kids in that same school say to me, look, you know, um, as you're in New York, we, it's going to be difficult for us to get it. Can you buy copies for each? And they each give me, um, or they tell me, buy it and then I'll, 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 I'll sell it back to them. 
So I um, buy 15 copies of the book and I bring it to this remote place in Papua New Guinea or wherever and I sell it to these people. My intention is not to, to, um, to infringe the right. My intention is to assist people who do not have access to those books. So how can I be infringing the copyright? Well, you're infringing because you're doing an act which is only reserved for the copyright owner. And it's important that, and it's interesting that you mentioned it's not your intention. Intention has nothing to do with copyright infringement. It doesn't matter what you intend. If you do the act, subject of course to whether any of the exceptions apply, you will be infringing. But what I thought you were actually going to say is that if you bring three copies for your friends, or a couple of copies of you traveled and you, you, you bought a book and you realized you like it, you've read it on your vacation, you bought a couple of copies for your friends. In that case, you'll not be issuing copies to the public, you're actually giving them to your friend. So if you take 15 and you put, put them up in a stall in your remote place, that's what you're doing, you're issuing them to the public by virtue of selling them. So it's not exactly, and I would imagine 15, even if you are friends, I think 15 is I think even too, to, to, to hire a number just to just give friends. I think that probably a couple. Yeah, a lot of friends, fine. <laughs> yeah, but but yeah, you would you would be infringing an intention is not a is not a, a, a determining factor here. I was asking about the Google images that we use in presentations that we find on the internet. Yeah, well of course How does this affect that? I mean I, I too use the, the images in my presentations. But but yeah it, it, it depends. I mean there's of course the the education exception, you can use it in terms of instruction. So if I'm, if I'm, if I'm having a class, then I'm, 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 I should be able to use uh, a picture of, uh, for example, I always take this photo of a, uh, a bunch of tomatoes when I'm doing plant varieties. Uh, and, and, but that, the education exception, instruction, should, would, would cover that. So if you're doing it for the purposes of instructing, or teaching, then it would it would be covered under the exception for for. So you are infringing. Well, you're not infringing because it, it's it's it, the copyright legislation would say that doing that act for that purpose would mean that you're not infringing. Before you continue. Yes, it, it, it's 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 ensuring that there is a balance, and that's why uh, the copyright legislation provides all these exceptions so that to allow persons who want to use various works for legitimate purposes to do so. I'm looking at authorship and infringement as it relates to student work. So we will come to oh, that I'm in sorry. a while. Okay. Yeah, it's, I, there's a section exactly on that. Are you looking though at what the students do or our use of student work? Because that's the issue. In terms of the, the, the lecture, uh -huh. using a student's work, but for example, uploading it on, on e-learning or giving copies to other students as an example of good work, let's say. Mm -hmm. Am I infringing the student's right? Sorry, let me add again. If you upload a student's work without a permission, you mean? Yes. Without a permission? You have student's work available to you, they've submitted it, you have it. Is it possible that you can use that student's work? You don't, the, the student is no longer there. The student has passed on, they've left university or whatever. Can I use their work as an example of good work? I'm trying to think of what right would you be infringing if you do that? You're making copies, uh, so you're just uploading it on, on Moodle, yes? Yes. I suppose you'll be, in a sense, making copies available because anybody can download it. So the fact that you're not getting physical copies is not is already neither here nor there. Um, I would say that you, you should you should get permission before doing so. But isn't that covered under the educational uh, exception? Well, you use it only for uh, instruction. Yeah, I suppose you, you, you'd be using it for, yeah, the, the education, ex uh, the, the exception for uh, teaching would probably would probably apply, I, I would have thought, but I'm actually thinking in terms of, if you make it available to students to simply see an example of a good work without reference to the copyright owner. Would it fall under the education exception? It, 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 it most probably would fall under the education exception, I, I believe, for teaching and instruction. 
Would it, would it also fall under what you mentioned earlier in case of um, someone working for an organization and their work becomes that of the organization, does that also work for the student's work? Sorry, repeat that. Let me hear that again. If I'm working for University of the West Indies and my job is to produce work, what I produce belongs to the University of the West Indies. Yes. Does that same policy work in terms of the student at the University of the West Indies? in that what they produce belongs to the University of the West Indies. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll be looking at, let, let me just come to the IP, the IP policy issues, because you, you, we have specific rules on that. What's your question? Just following on from the question she asked re regarding um, downloading certain images um, online and then posting that on Moodle um, for, for lecture purposes, uh, lecture notes. I, I, isn't it, um, I don't know, I, what do you think? I, I've always thought that it would be better to ask the permission from wherever you've uploaded, you know, downloaded that Im image from. But I think, or, or, you know, and then. The same principle applies that if you are using it for the purposes of uh, instruction or teaching, yeah. then you're allowed to use it without reference to the copyright owner. That's how the exceptions work. You don't need permission to use it. Okay, so, so that, words, then you that can would use be, it without permission. So then that would be different for, for, uh, for example, if someone was writing a thesis and was doing the same thing, then they would need to get permission. No, they wouldn't need permission either because writing, as it, actually I, had a, a, I was asked on that same point whether or not it would fall using photographs in a thesis would fall under the copyright exception. And I, it, 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 the person wouldn't need permission either. Right. It would fall under the education, um, teaching, and research exception. OK, there are the exceptions. Um, you're allowed to use copyright works, and that sort of leads directly into, into this, for research and private study. So the student doing research as part of the thesis would be able to use those photographs. Um, instruction, the lecturers would be able to use the photos if it's part of their instruction. Your private study, and journalists can use works in terms of using it for criticism and review and for reporting current events. But you need to have, there must be sufficient acknowledgement of the title and the author of the work. And there's also an exception where you've incidentally include, included someone's work in your own work. Um, for instruction and examination, However, in Barbados, this excludes copying by means of a reprographic process. Process, sorry. So, although you can use copyright works for instruction and examination, it does not cover photocopying. And you will see next slide um, reprographic copying. This can be done for the purposes of instruction, and you cannot copy more than five percent of the work in a three month in a three month period of time. However, the legislation makes it very clear, I think that's section 58 of the Barbados Copyright Act, that if there, is a, if there is a licensing regime available, then you cannot make use of that exception under legislation. So the act allows you to make photocopies of up to 5% in any three month period of time. However, it goes on to say, if there is a license, licensing scheme available, then you cannot make use of this. You must get a license which is how the big, the B copy issue now arises. Now that there is a licensing body out there, any such persons wishing to make use of, of reprographic copying of such works needs to go to B copy. Of course, I'm sure you've, you've all been aware of what's happening with, probably not, probably through the papers. But two, two issues I would want to point out quickly. First, through, I suppose, sloppy drafting um, or not careful drafting of the provisions, the section makes reference to education institutions. So uh, the uh, section 58 applies only to education institutions. Uh, when you look at the definition of education institutions in the Barbados Copyright Act, it makes reference to the Education Act of Barbados, which defines education institutions as excluding UWI and Sam, Sam, Samuel Jackman Prescott Polytechnic, I think. So it means first that UWE does not even fall under the legislation insofar as uh, it's not an education institution for the purposes of the Copyright Act. 
of course, generally it is, <laughs> but specifically as defined, it's not. But even more importantly, there's a case which came out in in July, the United the Canadian Supreme Court, in respect of the same issue, whether or not a lecturer can make copies of their works to students and gi give them to students more than one cop well, copies of parts of books. In that case, a secondary school teacher made copies of parts of books and distributed it to the students. Same issue arose. Can you do so? The Canadian legislation is exactly the same as Barbados. The exception for reprographic rights relate only to instruction. So in other words, if you are using it for the purposes of instruction, then you must go through that process. But the Canadian Supreme Court, by a majority, said, wait a minute here. The lecturers are not using, are not making the copies as part of their instruction. That's a wrong way to look at it. What's actually taking place is the students are using the works for research and private study. So in that way, the exception does not kick in. So by making the work available to the students, it is the students who are benefiting from the exception. It is not the lecturer making use of the works for instruction. So therefore, making copies available to students, the Canadian Supreme Court has held, falls under the fair dealing for research and private study because it facilitates the private study of students. So that case basically removes the entire basis of um, of the copies argument. Um, I, I've sent it on to the well, I think there are two arguments, not the University of Western this case, in Barbados, because it's legislation specific. Two, the education institutions is, doesn't cover it. But even if it did, even if, if you go by the reasoning of the Canadian Supreme Court, uh, because remember, it can only be done for the purpose of instruction, because this section concerning reprographic copying relates to the purpose of instruction. The court's reasoning is that Instruct is not the lecturers are not the ones benefiting here. The students are the ones using the works provided to them by the lecturers for the purpose of their research and private study. So, because you're using another exception, there is the exception for you will see it here. Sorry, research and private study and you have except instruction and examination, two separate exclusions. The reprographic, the reprographic, um, right, let me try this one. The reprographic relates to instruction. So if it falls under here, research and private study, the requirement to get a license does not apply. So in other words, you, you can do so. And the court accepted the, uh, in fact, the court rejected the argument of the, the licensing agency that sales of books have been diminished. The court actually said there was no evidence, and it's actually made the point that only if it could be shown that providing those short excerpts to students would in fact reduce the, the number of books purchased, then they could have a legitimate argument that the dealing was not fair. Because remember, the dealing in the work must be fair. In that case, they couldn't substantiate that point. Right, we looked at that. The exceptions for libraries, we've looked at. I've, I've had two sessions with the librarians on campus already on this, so I'm not going to um, go over it in any detail. The libraries are allowed to make, a, make and supply a copy of an article in a periodical, um, and the same for literature dramatic book, not in a periodical. The conditions, it must be for research and private study, and no more than one copy of an article or copies in the same journal. And it also provides for the amount of money that the library can recuperate in this regard. And it also relates to what it can do in terms of supplying to other libraries, replacing copies of works, copying unpublished works, and it accepts, exempts, sorry, parliamentary and judicial proceedings and from statutory inquiries. So we just had an inquiry from, the, what do you call it, what school was that? Wasn't it? The Alexandria Inquiry. So that um, 
that work anybody can copy without reference to to to, to, to any author. Um, anonymous work. Somebody. Well, I don't think anybody was making that point here. Um, you can you can use copy works which are which do not have a, an author if it's not possible to ascertain the author by reasonable inquiry um, and you can there's an exception for spoken word where you can report current events or broadcasts and you can just read that also lots of exceptions concerning reading or reciting recitation of work in public um, reconstruction of buildings no infringement of the copyright in the joints of the plans if you want to reconstruct a building. And playing of a sound recording for a charitable organization. So if you are playing a sound recording for a charitable organization, um, you, you, you can do so without reference to the, to the copyright owner. Time shift, shifting, anyone knows what time shifting is? Um, those of you who probably are at work when days, days of our lives are playing at one o'clock, the legislation allows you to tape it to watch it later. So, or any other, any program that you like. So you can tape it for later viewing, and that's what's called that's what is called time shifting. But it must only it must only be for private and domestic use. So you can tape whatever program that you want for later viewing, and that will not be an infringement of copyright. Because remember, you're copying it, but you must only use it later for, for yourself, your own domestic purpose. All right. So moving on swiftly to the section on integrity, and a lot of this is taken from the university policy on procedures on research ethics, February a recent the drafted policy, and it makes, basically makes the point that UWI requires honesty and integrity in research and scholarship, and there is a UE Office of Research is has responsibility for ethics of research policies. It makes the point that directors of centers, faculty deans, have the responsibility for the conduct of research within their, their faculties, departments, etc. And the primary responsibility for the conduct and content of research rests with the individuals. They must seek the various permissions and they must abide by the university policy in that regard. Regulation 5 concerns the duty of honesty and integrity. It makes the point that researchers are expected to maintain high standards of honesty and integrity. And any form of academic dishonesty is a serious offense and will it outlines the various offenses. The gathering, analysis, and reporting of data must be undertaken with honesty and integrity. So you cannot falsify data in order to get a particular result. It's unethical. And the policy makes that very clear. Researchers should never publish data that they, need, they know to be false. As true that they know to be false, or is the result of deliberate act of falsification. It also makes the point that plagiarism is an act of academic dishonesty and is to be considered and is considered to be misconduct meriting severe disciplinary penalties. Now the issue of plagiarism and copyright, there is a, there is an overlap of sorts, but it does not they, they need not always be the same. So for example, if someone If you copy, let's you copy a paragraph from someone's work and you include it in yours. You copy the entire, let's just say you copy the entire page, three, three or four paragraphs. That may or may not amount to copyright infringement. Because remember, we have to go through the whole the whole question of are you taking a whole or a substantial part thereof? So it may it may not amount to copyright infringement. But you nonetheless would have plagiarized because you've taken you've taken the exact the exact person's words. So in this case, it would not amount to copyright infringement, but 
it would be plagiarism. And I suppose anything which amounts to copyright infringement would invariably be plagiarism. But it all depends on, sometimes um, people think, for example, someone makes a point concerning, let's say, the, let's take a, a point in, let's just take Bobby, let's just say a history example, the, the, um, The attitudes of the, the the resistance of slaves in Barbados. Someone makes a point that slaves in Barbados, or story. Let's just say the story makes the point that slaves in Barbados, through their analysis, research, or the years of study, have, have, they have noticed that the slaves in Barbados resisted, but not in the same way as the slaves in other countries. Now, if you made that point. That point is not the result of imagination. Someone studied the data, someone looked at the historical record, someone formed that view. That person should be cited in the footnote for representing that point of view. So you certainly can't write in your thesis that slaves in Barbados resisted passively, for example be more specific about that. That person should be cited as the authority for that particular point of view. So in a sense, it, it will be, you would have plagiarized. So plagiarism does not necessarily mean taking the exact words of someone. It can also be taking that person's idea and passing it off as, as yours. So if someone has a, a particular thesis about something, and you mention that thesis as if it were your own point of view, to your own process of deduction. And that's dishonesty because it's not your idea. And that's where copyright law departs because copyright law would not protect that idea, but that idea originates from somebody. The idea of industrialization by invitation is by, is whose idea? So after Lewis, I can't imagine any Economist, economist with a straight face can make a similar point and not say who it's from. So that's where integrity comes in, because it may not necessarily amount to uh, copyright infringement, it may not necessarily be plagiarizing, but honesty and integrity would ensure that you have to cite the person whose idea, um, and that's what that's what this policy is about. So it, it departs, in a sense, from a strict copyright infringement. And it says here, researchers should not knowingly represent the published or unpublished work of another person as their own or assist anybody in doing so. The use, and that's important too, the use of work done by other persons must be appropriately and adequately acknowledged. You must acknowledge the person whose work your work has used, benefited from, that's why when I write, I always try to not read anything anyone has said. I know a lot of cases in social sciences do literature reviews, which I, 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 because how do you then divorce all this from what you want to say later on? So I just I read not, I read only the the cases and the, the statutes. After I've written, then then I'm interested in what other people have to say, and then you realize well. And then it becomes difficult, because now that you've written, you have all your ideas down, you're like, oh, well, somebody made a similar point. So what I do after in the footnote, this person makes a similar point. But I'm not going to just cite them as if it's their point. I'm like, you made a similar point, so you said I made it, I made it before. <laughs> you don't just give them the credit as if you, you, know, you don't think you don't hit it. But I mean, and it, it certainly presents a, a, a challenge, you know, because you want to make sure that... And that's why I try not to read a lot of work, because sometimes... You read other people's work and you start writing and then you're like, where did I get this from? You're wondering. So it becomes quite, you don't want to get in that quandary wondering, is this your point, is it not? So I just don't read any of the uh, secondary resources, no books, articles, until I have had a chance to digest the cases, digest the legislation for my own view, 
Um, and then sometimes I thought, I sometimes I think, well, I actually, I'm not interested in what anyone has to say. Um, I think my view is enough. Well, that's probably just just me. <laughs> no, but you can't plagiarize because remember, you can only plagiarize someone's work if you have access to it. So you can't plagiarize something which comes only from my from your head. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I understand that, but you are an academic, so you just assume that you have access to literature and then you um, are not concerned the literature, write something and then afterwards object the literature, then um, it is, you need this recorded, um, then it will be clear that, um, or at least in my view, that you have not, um, that you have plagiarized because... Well, I, you use that word very loosely, but I understand the context we use, but yeah. continue. <laughs> yes, apologies. Though. I don't mean to imply that. I'm saying that <laughs> it appears to me mm -hmm. that if we, um, because the way most um, students do it is that they, they read the literature, you ask them to do a review of the literature and as they write in, and they develop um, the ideas. Students always say, but I didn't read anything about this. I just, it just came to me. And where that is honest, um, it's the same argument that you make and you read the cases and so on, you form your, your opinions. And then you check the literature. Yeah. But there may be um, the chance that you didn't check all the literature, and there would be. Um, but what is what? Okay, if you don't check all the literature, what, what does that really affect? Does that affect the quality of your argument? I suppose it might if somebody has a stronger argument. They think that you have um, lifted that. Well, I suppose it, it's it's one thing for somebody to think that, but it's another thing for you know for for you to actually have done so. I mean. You know, you, you can make, I mean, it's, it's never full proof that everything you see or that you would see every single literature um, on, 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 on the issue. I mean, I've seen articles and I just read the first few paragraphs and I'm like, I, 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 I'm not interested in reading anything you have to say. Does it mean, therefore, that on page nine, if I make a same, same point as a person without having read the article on page nine because I only stopped at page one, is it, is it that I'm doing something wrong? Of course not. But how do you prove that? But, how do you prove that? But, but it's, it's, always, it's, it's, always, it's, it's always subject to proof. How do you prove that somebody, is infri somebody has, infringing, has infringed your work? You have, to, you have to ensure that when you write, what you have written is yours. I don't have to prove anything. If someone believes that I have infringed, they have to prove that I first have taken a substantial part, or anybody. Because it's not for a person to justify, and let me tell you how it, how it works. In terms of copyright infringement, the person would have to uh, first show the similarities and show that that person had access to that work. So then that person, there's a presumption of copying. Then the, the, the burden then shifts to the defendant in that case to show that I created it work on my own without reference to, and I, I think your, your concern is about how do you prove it? And I mean, in court, how do you prove it? Persons would swear affidavits concerning what they've used, how they've created their works in, a, in, a, in an actual case, and they will be subject to cross-examination. The lawyers, their own lawyers would cross-examine them. T tell me how you created this work. What did you use? What sources did you use? And then they'll be subject to cross-examination. Examination by their own lawyer, cross-examination by the others, and possibly questioning by the judge. And of course, in civil matters, it's a question of the burden of proof. The burden of proof is balance of probabilities. Whether the judge believes that person as telling the truth based on the way they respond to answers, their frankness, their general demeanor, are they believable? And after having, so, uh, after having considered the evidence, the judge may very well form a view that that person came across as forthright, that person came across as honest, and I therefore believe that person's story. But I do, I do take your point that the question of, of proof in a general sense is uh, uh, one which one must be, must be uh, careful of. You always say something. Uh, just a, a comment. Um, I understand uh, and I, I, can, I can appreciate your, your argument from a legal perspective because in terms of, of, your res of the research that you're giving an example of, you're, you're consulting the laws and other legal documents before writing um, 
your uh, your paper. Uh, but I, I wondered, in terms of scholarly research, which is one of the things that. Uh, we have been told that in terms of writing, one needs to be able to consult the literature, especially if, if you're looking at the social sciences or the humanities, where one has to consult not necessarily legislation uh, and, and, and legal documents and then write an opinion on, where one needs to do some aspect of scholarly review to support whatever argument you're trying to make in your writing. Uh, can one really, can, I'm asking, can you uh, use your method in law Yes, you can. Yes. To the yes, social can. sciences. Well, I'm not sure if you can use the social sciences. I don't know how it operates in social sciences. But that, that's, but, that's my question. Really. But surely, um, when you write uh, pieces in law, I'd imagine, of course, you can be informed by what else, of course, you can always be informed by what other academics have to say. Um, and I've been writing in my area for the last how many how many years, and of course you can benefit from reading someone else's article. You can benefit from reading someone else's someone else's someone else's work. Um, but it all depends on how confident you are in in your own ability, in your own thought processes. If somebody has just written is now writing in the area and you've been writing in it for a long while, you think well. There's nothing that you can tell me that I I, I, I I can tell. But 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 more to the point that in law the process of reasoning, uh, at least initially for me, it's a question of going back to the basics, going back to the original sources, your cases, your legislation. In the same way, I'm, I, I'd imagine that saving applies to to, uh, to to any any field. You go to the the archives. You do original research, and then you, you synthesize it. And then you may well want to look at what other people have to say. But then, if, if you look at what other people have to say, and you, you form the view that they don't have anything to say, I can't imagine you must necessarily engage in that process for its own sake. That's, that's And especially if you're in a field where there aren't many people writing in your field, or if the people who are writing are not saying anything worthy, then it certainly doesn't make it doesn't add anything because the whole point of scholarship is is not simply to just uh, you know you know use persons material or, or, or make reference to them just so there must there must be value if if there's no value in, in in it then you know engaging it for its own sake doesn't doesn't I'd ra you know I'd rather spend the time making sure that my own views are are, are mature, are, are more are more carefully thought through, than reading you know five articles which 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 which, which just waste my time. So it's a question of how how you how you approach. But I do take your point that of course, uh, engaging in scholarship of course entails and reading what other people have to say. But it certainly doesn't mean that you must necessarily incorporate it as a, a counter argument to what you're saying, unless. Unless it, it, it's actually a valid, a valid counter argument, or it, it, it actually contributes to the debate, or contributes to the, the, the point that you're making. Okay. This speaks to conflicts of interest. Uh, conflict of interest arises when a researcher has a material interest, whether personal, financial, professional or otherwise which may conflict with the researcher's duty of honesty and integrity. If that conflict arises, the researcher is required to disclose this to the university. There's also an issue of misuse of research funds where a funding agency provides funding for research and provides guidelines. Those, that, those funds must be used in accordance with those guidelines. And they must also follow the university's codes related to management and disbursement of funds. A failure or misuse or failure to account of those funds, the, the, the policy makes very clear, will result in disciplinary procedures under Ordinance 8. And I'm sure you're all familiar with Ordinance 8. No? Well, if you're not, you should read it. It concerns you directly. Ordinance 8 concerns promotion and also concerns disciplinary disciplinary action against members of the university. So it's probably one of this, the central ordinances that governs your relationship with the university. So if you don't have a copy of Ordinance 8, you should really get a copy and read it and know it inside out. Ordinance 8 of the university statutes um, uh, 
statutes, rules, and ordinances. It's found on um, what they call it, Microsoft and the resources or whatever they call it. Collaborative research, research collaborators. Should I, well, it's just making the point that before you engage in collaborative research, you must first sort out copyright issues. It could become very ticklish later on when you have to sort after the fact issues concerning copyright or intellectual property. You must attempt to resolve these issues beforehand. And you will see that the policy makes it very clear that if you do not have an agreement among the researchers, it stipulates the rules that will apply in terms of attributing authorship. It says that authorship shall be attributed to all those persons, whether staff members or students, who have made a significant scholarly contribution to the work. So it doesn't distinguish between student participation, student involvement, and um, staff. If you made a significant scholarly contribution, then you should also be recognized as an author. It also makes it very clear that, that an administrative relationship to the investigation, so persons providing administrative support, will not qualify them for co-authorship. It also speaks to the order of names in a publication. That is to be decided on the quality of contribution, which is why it's good to decide that in advance. Because what if someone says, well, I, I think I did more work. Well, it's, well, obviously, it's the quality, not quantity. So if, if, if you probably did all the field work and the person sat down and synthesized it, then how do you determine that? So that, that can be a very tricky, tricky issue. It's probably good to try resolve these issues in advance. But the rules provide that the order of names in the publication is decided according to quality of contribution, the extent of the responsibility and accountability for results and the customs of the discipline. You notice they always have that, the customs of a discipline. Each discipline may very well have their own rules, customs, conventions, considering how these things are done. And so the university doesn't want to uh, provide a general set of rules which may conflict with a particular convention in a particular discipline. So it's always subject to that. And the attribution of authorship is not affected by whether the researchers were paid for their contribution or by their employment status. The attribution of authorship um, is not determined simply because the person provided free research or paid research. So if you have a report, and even in terms of reports, you get student involvement, student input, then you should acknowledge it somehow, and you will see later on, certainly not necessarily as author, if, if, it's, if, um, if that's not the case, but that's in, in some way, you'll see how, next slide, but probably later on. It also makes it clear that the rules apply to whether the collaborators are staff or students, so it doesn't make a distinction, as I said before. It also makes it clear that where the, the article is a multi-author article and is based primarily on the student's research, the student should be given, should be granted priority prominence in the list of co-authors. So the, big one. For example, if, if, if the, if the um, article is based on a student's research, a student's doing a PhD, if it's based on the student's research, the student should probably, the student's name should probably appear first on the article. So I think it would probably, if it's three, and I think, I would imagine that it would, it would be if it's four co-authors, the, the person with the primary responsibility, or the person whose quality uh, is greater than should be first and according to, um, of course it has to be agreement between the parties because you can very well, and it, it, it's significant too because I think um, even for the purposes of uh, promotion and, and whatnot, if your name is six, then one assumes that the, uh, the, the, the farther down your name is, then the, the less important you are in terms of the article. <laughs> so so I, th I think that has a, a, some role to play in terms of uh, um, if there are 
if it's more than four authors, then you don't get you don't get credit for it at all. If it's one or two, the, I can't remember. I can't remember the rules. What the rules say, but I think it's found in some some document I have at home. You were saying something? Well, I, I I used to think so until I looked at uh, quite a few number of universities in North America. The professor name goes last. Uh, um, my son is currently in a university in Canada, and he's an undergraduate, but he's writing papers already. <laughs> and um, uh, the student name goes up front, and the professor, if there are five names on the list, the, the, the person who is in charge of the lab, who is really doing most of the, um, who has the, the master plan of what they want to go forward, that name is last. I suppose, and, um, that, I suppose that person's name is last because their contribution is probably not as great as the others. I can't right. imagine a, a professor in some any university who made a substantial contribution to the to the field and would have their student's name. That's what I'm it. wondering whether the whole I, thing is changing because I, that's what I'm I'm seeing uh, now. I, I I don't think so, but I, I'm obviously subject to correction on that. But I I, I would have thought not. Um, in the in the UK system, when you look at the the authorships, the the first author is most important, but the last author is also more important than the first author. Why? Based on, they are usually the principal investigator for the project, and they are also the ones most likely who have written the or if they haven't written the, the paper, they will be the corresponding author. So they're usually the last author. Okay. Um, in my field, we have. We have at least one or two authors, not not a, in the science field, I sometimes see six authors, but I, I, I don't know what the conventions are, so I can't really speak to it. Um, based on these rules, it says given um, priority prominence, in my view, I, I took that to be first, but what I'm hearing is that possibly last. I can't imagine, after I look at the first author, I don't look, I don't look at the rest, so I'm not sure how given, putting the student's name seventh is Given it, given the student um, priority prominence, because um, after I see one author, I I tend not to look at the rest. But that's just probably just me. Right. This speaks to. Um, it provides additional rules concerning um, the author who submits a manuscript. Um, Accept responsibility for all the co-authors, and should include all the persons who are entitled to co-authorship, and should not include anyone who is not so entitled. A copy should be a copy of the uh, the manuscript should be submitted in advance of submission, um, and to, you must obtain the the consent. Um, of the co-author. I think I made that point earlier earlier on that uh, if, there's, if you have co-authorship, you would need a consent before submitting it. And the primary reason for that is that the publisher would not, um, um, you certainly don't want to approach a publisher who would then agree to the publication on the basis that all the authors would have consented only when they send you the licensing agreement, the publishing agreement, or publishing license agreement, only to find out that one of the authors are not interested, or were not consulted. And um, obviously it'll be quite embarrassing. So you, you, want, so you want to avoid that. And also, you will see C, it says, other contributions to the manuscript should, in, in, should be indicated in the footnote on acknowledgement section. So if a student has done research for you, you put that in the acknowledgement. Any other contribution, editing, otherwise, should be there somewhere. So that's quite important. And of course, it's always subject to the, in accordance with the, the, the practice of the discipline and the publisher, what um, is expected in this regard. And we go down to the university copyright, and you will see that this policy on, on research ethics makes a direct reference to the university policy on intellectual property. It says here, the university policy and local legislation governs copyright issues in relation to research undertaken by staff and students. So we'll go on to consider, and we have just about enough time. UE IP policy, University of Western is policy on intellectual property. It's an old policy, which obviously needs um, updating. I think there's a, we're going to set up a committee soon to, 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 to revise it. It basically sets out the principles governing ownership of intellectual property rights of those involved in 
the administrative arrangement and management of IP at the university. It covers both copyright and patents. It covers copyrightable materials and inventions. Of course, we're only concerned with copyright today, so we're not going to look at any of the uh, issues concerning inventions. The policy covers both academic and non-academic staff members. And interesting enough, it also includes staff on sabbatical leave. It also includes some others, for example, persons who are here on visiting, um, uh, visiting lecturers, but of course, subject, to, of, subject of course to whatever agreement uh, that the university has entered into in respect of the person being at the university for that particular period of time. And in terms of ownership, it says here that and the university IP policy mirrors the law of Barbados, is that the creator of the work is the first owner of the copyright in the work, and it makes it clear that it's subject to any contrary agreement, which we emphasized earlier. It also makes it clear that the employer has automatic ownership in the work if it's created under a contract of employment. So if the work is created as part of the person's employment, if they're engaged to do that kind of work, if they're engaged in that capacity, then it belongs to the employer. Of course, subject always to an agreement to the contrary. Contract law would trump the provisions of the legislation. And it says here, it looks at the policy maintains a traditional relationship between the university and staff members who are authors of scholarly artistic works whereby copyright in textbooks, monographs, papers, lecture notes, unpublished manuscripts, slides, that is it, huh? are the exclusive property rights of the staff member, except, except where they are produced as part of a sponsored program or other agreement where the university claim ownership under the policy. And we're looking at the circumstances where the university will claim authorship of the intellectual property, notwithstanding this. A staff member who owns copyright in a work has full responsibilities and exclusive rights to proprietorship. So it basically says that if a staff member owns copyright in a work, that staff member um, would have all the rights of exclusive proprietorship and would enjoy all royalties payable in respect of that work. So the university would not, in, would not dictate that it should share in any of the royalties, the mega royalties that you get for publishing um, books or whatnot. However, of course, there's always a, a caveat. If during the preparation of the work by the staff member, the university incurs incremental costs, it shall be able to recover those costs. Which is why when you do all your big consultancies, um, well, some people do, <laughs> um, you have to pay 15%. Uh, and that's part of it, obviously not exclusively that, um, to the consultancy fund. And of course, the university also makes it very clear that by virtue of using its own resources and facilities, and sometimes resources and facilities, including perhaps um, secretaries who may, who may very well type the work for you, the staff member shall grant, and notice the word shall, not may grant, shall grant, the, the university a royalty free right to reproduce and use the work within the university. So you have no choice where that's concerned. The university would have the right to reproduce your work and use it within the university in recognition of the general resource and facilities that are provided by the university for you to create that work. That's the least you could do, I would have thought. It also provides that the university owns copyright in the following cases. And of course, it's always subject to where there is a a written agreement to the contrary. So the university owns copyright in the work A, where the university specifically asks or directs a staff member to undertake the work in question. So the university asks you specifically to create that work, 
then the university would own that own the copyright in the work. Where the university employs the staff for the express purpose of creating or producing the works. So a lot of persons who um, produce reports, persons who work in educational media services, they are in the process, they are paid to create copyright works. So the university policy is saying where you're employed to create or produce works in which copyright subsists, then the university would own the work or where your job description makes this your responsibility, for example, editors, filmmakers, media producers, etc. And we have some here today. And the university is very generous, it seems. It says the university may allow a staff member who created a work in which the university claims copyright to share in any royalties. So where you've created a work, because either you are employed to do so or because the university has expressly asked you to do so and the university uh, gets royalties as a result, it's saying that it may, notice the use of the word may, permissive, it doesn't have to, it may allow you to share in the royalties. And well, that, 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 that's worded weirdly because it says the university may, but then it says provided an appropriate agreement was entered into. So it doesn't seem to make much sense that the university may if an agreement, because if you, if you enter into an agreement beforehand, chances are you'll be bound by that agreement and therefore follow it. So the use of the word may where you have an agreement seems to be a bit, a bit strange, but I suppose they'll, they'll review that when they next <laughs> review in the policy. Right, so sponsored research, where you create intellectual property pursuant to sponsored research by a donor. The copyright in that work will be determined in accordance with whatever provisions that are made in respect of that sponsored research. Most times you sign a collaborative agreement with another institution or research agreement, whatever have you, the provisions of that um, of that agreement will determine the extent of copyright protection. Okay, in respect of sponsored research, student research, where a student produces a work based on research conducted under the supervision of a member of staff and is part of the student's academic program. So for example, a PhD student carrying out research as part of their thesis, then the university will not pay proprietary interest in that work, except in circumstances outlined in paragraph 2.9, which will be going on, going on to. So in other words, the university will not claim any proprietary interest in students' research where they are pursuing that research as part of a, an academic program. And these are, these are the circumstances in which the, student, the university may claim copyright, copyright, proprietary rights in a work created by a student, where the staff involvement in the creation of the work is substantial, and the university desires to exercise its rights, its right, sorry, based on that involvement. So if the uh, involvement of a member of staff is substantial, then, uh, but one would have thought that that certainly wouldn't apply in the case of a student's thesis. Shouldn't, <laughs> obviously, shouldn't, it shouldn't be the case that um, the member of the staff involvement in a student's thesis should be anything but substantial. It, it's actually, it shouldn't be at all. Um, secondly, where the work is part of a larger work over which the university intends to exercise its right. So if the work is part of a larger project, then of course the university can exercise its right to have proprietary interest in that. In that. And certainly the student would be one of, well, may very well be one of other persons affected because it's, the work is part of a larger work. And the use of facilities by that student, equipment or other resources, are substantially in excess of the norm. How do you determine that? I, I'm not exactly sure. I don't know what the, what the norm is. I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what, I know what the norm is. But it's essentially saying that where that student has, has had access to facilities which are greater than what the norm is, then the university may claim 
um, provide your interest in that in that work. And it also speaks to how do you distribute income and cost. Um, first, the university would uh, use the income generated in terms of marketing and development cost, and it would also reimburse itself for its own financial input. And any monies it derives from the use and exploitation of the works would be used to develop its own academic research program and resources. There are other elements. Well, the other elements to this IP policy relates to inventions, which we'll not be considering today. And I think that comes, that's slide 53? Yes, that's, that's the end. Thank you very much, everyone. I should, I should ask if you have any questions, but I'm sure you probably don't. Um, okay, a lot, lots of times when we publish in the sciences, uh, we sign away the copyright, basically, to the publishers. Uh, can the university, because there's a slide that you have here that says that we, we should also allow the university to, uh, the right to reproduce uh, internally or for internal use or so. But most of the time, we require to sign that away. And um, uh, can the university, um, you know, uh, have a separate rule that uh, doesn't take that into account that we've already signed it away? Yeah, that would have to be, that would have to be subject to whatever rights um, uh, whatever third party rights, and in, in which case, if you have uh, if you have assigned the copyright, the ownership to, to a publisher, then the university cannot exercise any rights um, which would affect the rights of the publisher in that regard. So, if you have copyright, if you if you own the copyright, then the university exercises that right. If you've assigned it to a third party to a publisher, put them publish an article, the university's rights cannot be exercised mm. in that regard. Yeah. Excellent question. Thank you so much. So that's it. Well, we want to thank you so much for thank coming, for, for sharing this moment with the Instructional Development Unit. Do, do we have distribution rights of this, Professor? <laughs> I encourage you as you go to share with your colleagues who could not make it this, this morning. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.